everybody, this is Mike with the One Stop Co-op Shop, and today we're looking at a solo playthrough of Oath, the newest release from Leader Games. And a quick thank you to Leader for sending me a review copy of this one. Now the designer of Oath has made it clear that this is a game really meant for multiple players, and the solo mode is just kind of an add-on to get you through more sessions, but how rewarding is it? Well, we'll check it out. Although a quick note that I am not doing a separate review video for this one. Instead, kind of like my Kickstarter coverage, I'm gonna do some impressions at the end of the video, so feel free to use the time stamps and the chapters to jump right to that if you want. And if you like the content here on the One Stop Co-op Shop, please consider supporting us on Patreon. You get early access to our videos, get to help us pick which games we'll cover. You can also listen to our weekly podcast, check out our separate streaming channel, or join our Discord for great conversations every day. So we'll start with an overview of gameplay for Oath. Each player has a large pawn that's going to move between these different sight cards. Uh, here the AI is controlling the Chancellor, which is kind of like the current ruler of the region, and I am one of the exiles trying to uh, usurp him. And the game is played over the course of up to eight rounds, although I could win early if I accomplish one of my goals, or if the Chancellor is winning whenever we cross one of these spots, we roll a d6 die, and there's a chance the game ends immediately with them winning. And in a given turn, I'm going to perform a variety of actions, spending supply to enact these actions, and sometimes favor, just coins, or secrets, books, to pay for different costs. And a lot of actions are going to interact with this world, deck, and other cards in the game. Each card belongs to one of six different suits, and they can be played either on the sight cards that we're moving around, or in my ambassador area, which can hold up to three cards, giving me sole access to their powers. And some cards have this little tree icon, which means they can only be played on sites. Some cards have this little silhouette, which means they can only be played as an advisor. Players also have war bands, these smaller meeples, and the Chancellor starts with them on some sites, which are from the previous game. This is not a campaign game per se, it's not a legacy game, it's sort of a like mishmash of some of those mechanics, in that uh, the stuff that happens at the end of one game will kind of play forward into the next game, even if you're not playing with the same players. It kind of the game state changes in terms of which sites are in play, uh, which character rules, which cards start on some sites, that kind of stuff. But back to the warbands, they'll be on the site. Somebody has at least one warband on a site, then they rule that site, and the only way you can take it away is by attacking and defeating their warbands. They'll also have some warbands in their supply. I've got most of mine here, and each player generally starts with three on their board. I'm just keeping them down here. Uh, these are kind of like traveling around with me, will help me attack or defend whenever my pawn is involved. Now the automa is going to do a lot of the same actions that I do, but with some differences. But the key thing is they're going to draw three cards every turn, and one of the cards is going to move up one of their tokens into one of these spots. That will both tell them how many actions they get. So like if this guy moved up on their first turn, they would get two actions. And let's say this one on their second turn, two actions again. Ooh, but their third turn, this one moves up. Now they get three actions. So if they like get the same suit multiple times, they'll get to do more stuff. And their actions are dictated by their mind, which is this sheet over here, kind of like this set of matrices. And they're going to follow these little arrows from their current starting point. Uh, each space will use up an action. If they actually do it, sometimes they'll skip them. And sometimes they'll stay in the same quadrant if they're trying to accomplish a certain goal. Sometimes they'll jump up and try to do other things as they kind of move around. But that should be enough to go on for now. You'll see the specific actions as I and the Chancellor take them. I'll explain them then. But a quick note on victory. There are four different oaths you can play in a game, and the new one is determined by the winning player at the end of the last game. In this case, the AI beat me in my last game, so they are the Chancellor, and they randomly picked the Oath of Devotion, which means they want to hold the darkest secret, this uh, special banner that they start with, and I can try to steal from them to make myself the victor instead of them. There's also this idea of a successor, because besides exiles and chancellors, there's also a third role called a citizen that is tacitly aligned with the chancellor, but can work against him at the same time. But with a two-player game with just me and the Automa, there's never going to be a citizen. It's always going to be exile me versus chancellor them, so that won't come into play. Additionally, somewhere in this deck, there are visions that will let me activate an alternative victory condition. So potentially, even though we're fighting over the darkest secret, I could end up winning the game by, like, capturing the most sites or getting the people's favor or something else. We'll see as they come up. But actually, before we start, I have to decide where I'm going to put my pawn. I have to pick my starting advisor. 
So over here, we've got kind of the Chancellor's Stronghold from last game. All these cards kind of played forward. We've got the Plains, which is extra easy for someone to attack into with the Memory of Home and Longbows there. That's going to give the AI a nice little attack bonus there. We've also got the Step, which gives us free secrets, which is going to be needed to get the Banner of the Darkest Secrets, so it contributes directly to victory if we play Nomad cards specifically, like the Ancient Binding that's already here, which is an interesting card in itself because it would let me burn a ton of secrets of another player's, which could matter because, again, this is going to be kind of a secret war at first as we both fight over this Banner of the Darkest Secrets. There's also a hidden relic here. I can peek at that if I'm on the site. A new site that wasn't in the last game, the Ancient City, also has a relic. And by the way, that's because there's a little R in the upper left here, so you can tell that it starts with one. Uh, the little two here indicates how many denizen cards, the basic cards, can be played to the right of this site. And this ability says whenever you play a blue card, the Order Suit, you get to muster two warbands for free. And then finally in the Hinterlands, we've got the Lush Coast. Nothing too special there. It would let you move to another coast for cheaper, but there aren't any yet. And then this one was also in the last game, but the Chancellor did not hold it when they won. It previously had this edifice that I had built, the Sprawling Rampart, but because they didn't hold it, it fell into disrepair, and now it's a Bandit Rampart, which would make it tough for anyone attacking that site to prevail. And additionally, it has this X for trading and mustering. You'll hear about those actions soon, which means you basically can't uh, use these bandits to build your own army or get money and stuff. They don't want to deal with you. Plus, it's got a relic. Oh, and another ability here, if someone plays an arcane card, this little triangle symbol to this site, which can hold up to two cards, uh, they get a free secret, kind of like the step you already saw. And each player, not the AI, gets a choice of three cards. I've got an order card, a messenger, for one money, one favor, I can move around my warbands. Not going to matter as much for a non-combat scenario like this one. Rain Boots is a Nomad card. This means it's a battle plan card, so you can use it when attacking. That's why it's red as a little boost. In this case, it would stop some of my opponent's shields, but it discards itself. Although it is a Nomad card, so I could play it on the step to gain a free secret. That might be worth doing. And then finally, a small favor, a Discord card, has to go into my advisors. And the little chain means I can never get rid of it. But when I play it, I would gain four Warbands immediately, so this really boosts my army up a bunch. But yeah, I'm thinking that the free secret is pretty dang good, and I might get rain boots. And you can put cards as advisors face down. Basically, they're in a holding pattern until as a minor action, as a free action on your turn, you can either flip them face up into your advisors or play them to your site, which I'll probably plan to do on the step to get the secret. And speaking of, I guess that means I'll start here. But the Chancellor always takes the first turn in each round, so let's jump into the Clockwork Prince's first turn and kind of show how the whole AI works. So the first step of the Clockwork Prince's turn is to assess threat. And they're going to see basically if I am close to winning with any of the different ways you can win in the game. I am not, so it's going to be no threat, nothing going on. Next, very important for their turn, they're going to search and play one card. They'll take the top three cards of the world deck. There are also discard piles that you can mess with for each of the different areas in the game. And they're going to flip them in the order they drew them, and they're mainly looking at the suits up here. And we need to know if they're going to try to play their card as a friend or as a conspirator. We look at where their little action token over here is currently located. It's in this part of the mine that says play conspirator, or if it's an unaligned card, make it a conspirator. Let's see what that means. At the bottom of their board here, you'll see a token for each suit, and they're all unaligned. But as the game goes along, they'll either move into the conspirator or friend track, and that'll give the AI their actions and have other effects. Now, they want to play one of these suits that they already have as a conspirator, but that's not possible, so they're going to play an unaligned. All these are unaligned, so they pick the leftmost one, which is going to be Animal Playmates, which would have given a bonus for mustering troops. And since that is a beast card, their beast suit is going to move up. They'll have two actions this turn. Now, normally for whichever card they pick, they would play it to a site, preferring the leftmost and the topmost that has room. So the planes can hold three. They only have two here, so they would play it there. But the card they chose is Advisors Only, so instead they just discard it along with the other cards they drew. And discarded cards go to the top of the next discard pile over, so from the cradle where we just were, to the provinces in the middle. From here they would get discarded to the hinterland, and then from the hinterland back to the cradle. And the AI is searching in the world deck, but we could search in here as well. 
Like if we really wanted one of these cards, we could make that happen. Now when the AI can't play a card, you see that in each of the little quadrants, there's a little can't play a card thing. It says they gain one warband for free, one secret, and one tactic. So warbands is common from their supply. They've got four. Secrets, I'm not loving that since we're gonna be fighting over those. They get one there. And tactics is this track here that gives them free attack dice or subtracts attack dice for me when I attack them. So as the AI kind of goes along, they'll get stronger and stronger in combat. And by the way, for each of the AI's drawn cards in that step, uh, if they have this little battle plan icon, which is this uh, horseman campaign icon with kind of a crown around it, they gain a tactic for each of those cards, but luckily none here. And also when they play a card or discard it, they're going to get one favor, one coin. You've got a supply that starts with three for each suit from the suit matching the card. But when they can't play the card, this favor is gonna to go to their ambition spot, which is much more limited in its use as opposed to their regular favor, which they can use to recruit war bands and lots of other stuff. All right, now we actually go to their take action step. And remember they are getting two actions. And the priorities up here, they always wanna follow a red path. If they can't, they follow an orange path. If they can't, they follow a black path. And you really have to follow the arrows to their conclusion. And you are looking for an arrowhead because there's lots of lines, but not all of them are going in the direction they need to go. And you wanna see what it says. So we look, the red one, their first priority says, hold DS, dark secret. Yes, they do, they started with it. So they're going to ignore the orange and black arrows here and just go bloop. They're gonna search for their first action. And this is literally identical to the action they just did. They're gonna draw three cards, flip them over, uh, move up one of their tokens. But the key thing is they don't change the number of actions. They're still stuck with the two they started with. Ooh, and they are happy because they got another one of these beast cards. So they're going to be uh, really high up with them already. These other two get discarded to the provinces. And then they also drew second win, which has a battle plan. So that's another tactic upgrade for them. Now this time they can play the card. It says if you put a secret on it, as an action, you can kill one warband on the board of a player who has either an order or a discord advisor to gain one warband. Wow, so you just basically steal it from them. And again, they always play it on the leftmost and then highest site that has room. So the planes now have this. And by the way, when do cards matter? Anybody whose pawn is on a space can generally use any cards at their site. But additionally, whichever player rules a site, which remember means you have at least one warband there, so right now it's just the chancellor for these, has kind of open access to any of the cards they rule, even if they move away. So it's nice to rule things. And battle plan cards, the reason they have this little crown is because they're only accessible to the ruler. So even if I was here, I could not use their longbows. Sad for me. Because they played a beast card, they get one favor. And this one does go to their general supply because they actually played the card. So that was one action, they have one left and all the arrows are coming in except for this black arrow going up. So they're actually changing which like part of the mind they're in and they're going to do the muster action to get some troops. And how that works is they look at their current site and they're going to put one favor on every card there that they can, in this case they have three favor. And for each card they're able to muster from, they get two warbands, so good. Lord, they have a big army already. And with that, they go into cleanup, which is basically where we clear away secrets and favor that was used this turn. The key thing this is gonna matter for my turn quite a bit in a second is that secrets come back to your board, unless you did an action that actually burns them, which are pretty rare. But favor, on the other hand, is lost to the player and it goes back to the supply of its indicated suit. So hearth and order and beast, all three of them have more favor to pull from. That was a pretty rough first turn for me. They've got two secrets, so it's gonna be tough to take the uh, Banner of the Darkest secret from them. They've got a ton of warbands to fight me with. They've already got one of their tokens up twice, yikes. Oh, and by the way, a key thing about the AI's flowchart, very different from a lot of flowcharts like you might see in a coin game or something. You move the start token underneath to remind you where they've been and help you keep track of actions but they're going to actually start from where they are this turn. It's not like they're going to recalculate their actions from here again. They will jump back to these red spaces, but that's only when a threat trigger activates at the beginning of their turn. Basically when I'm about to win, they'll be like, oh crap, I need to do this or I need to do that to stop them. All right, now it's my turn. I've got three piddly war bands. I've got a little defensive card I can play. We got one favor and one secret. What do I want to do if I can play some Nomad cards here, like my Rain Boots, I can get a free secret, although since the AI rules here, they'll literally get access to my Rain Boots by me giving them to them, so maybe that's not the best idea. If I get enough secrets, I can use the Recover action to snatch the Banner of the Darkest Secret away from the Chancellor. How it works is it starts with one secret, and as an action, I need to use more secrets than are currently here. So I need to have at least two to be able to get this away from the Chancellor and set myself up to potentially win. 
But ideally, I might want to put three or four on it to make it really tough for them to take it back so I can clinch that win. All right, but anyway, wise or not, for my first action, um, this is free. It's just a minor action. I'm going to play the Rain Boot. And again, because it's a Nomad suit, I'm going to get a free secret. Normally, I would have to spend a favor to make that happen. I'll show you how that works in a second. But I would like to ideally get an advisor. So next, I'm going to use a search action, a lot like what you've seen the AI doing. It'll cost me two supply. And that's going to get me the top three cards of the world deck. Now, why two supply? You'll see because this little token here uh, is on the two. But as visions are revealed from the deck by me or the AI, it's going to move over. Two key things about that. First of all, the supply cost will increase as those vision cards show off. Remember, those are alternate victory conditions. But the other big thing is I can't use a vision card to actually win the game until at least three visions have shown up. Now, as an alternative, I could search the top three cards of one of the discard piles. It would have to be the region that I'm in. And that always costs two supply. Well, let's go to the world deck because I do want visions to show up. And here we go. One of them is the third card. You stop drawing in a search action once you draw vision. So if it had been second, I wouldn't have gotten to look at three cards. Or gosh, if it had been on top, I would have just drawn this and nothing else. But with it being third, I'll get to consider it as one of my options. Ooh, what a good card. What a good card. Uh, Nomads, I already have a bunch at my site. That's pretty good. Look, Elders, for two favor, putting it on this card, I can just gain a book straight up. Now, it's not as amazing as it seems because with where I am, I can gain books anyway, but if I have it with me, I'll kind of bring book generation wherever I go. But I have to also consider the Vision of Sanctuary, this alternate victory condition. And it says, uh, wait, this will be at the start of my turn. I win if I hold the most relics and banners, and at least three visions have been drawn from the book. Now, the Chancellor always starts with this one relic, the Grand Scepter, which is kind of uh, worthless in 1v1 against the AI play because uh, it lets them, like, make you a citizen and such. And they also have the Banner of Darkest Secrets, the thing we're fighting over. So right now they have a 2 to 0 advantage over me for this vision, so I'm not too excited about that. And then Levelers, I can put a secret on this to kind of move a favor around in the bank, which can be pretty useful, especially to try to kind of uh, cut off the AI source of money. But yeah, the Elder card seems too good to pass up here. Now I do mark that I've drawn the first vision. And just like the AI, I'm discarding to the provinces because it's one over from where I am. And the elders wanted to fit on my site anyway. Can only hold two cards, but I want them as an advisor. You can have up to three of those, boom. Although unfortunately when you play an advisor, you don't get any favor from the bank. That's only if you play it to the site. But now I'm gonna show you another really important action, which is the trade action. And you have two options with a trade action. You can either put a secret on a card at your site and when you do, you get one favor from the matching suit bank, as well as plus one favor for each matching advisor you have. So here I'm going to get two from Nomads, not bad. And then the other trade option is to put two favor on a card, and then for each of your advisors that matches, you get one secret. So if I didn't have any matching advisors, I literally couldn't get any secrets from doing that. And yes, I can do that anyway with Elders, but why not do it with Rain Boots while I'm here? So I'll spend another supply to put two on here. And that gets me a third secret. And by the way, I shouldn't forget, I can look at any relics in my site for free. Let's see, as an action, put this relic on the bottom of the relic deck to gain four supply. That's pretty nice. Now, how do I gain that relic? Each site that has the R to show you can get a relic there will have the cost down here. So here I'd have to have three favor to give to the nomads and that would let me get the map, which is a pretty good item, but I'm not gonna worry about it yet. Now the AI went a little crazy with recruiting and I'm worried they're gonna kill me. So I think uh, for my next action, I'm going to travel. That'll cost me one supply. You'll see why in a moment. So traveling moves you to another site and the cost and supply depends on where you are. And it's uh, indicated here at the top. So the little like kind of rotation means another site in your same region. So for one supply, this is what I'm doing. I can move it to the plains. For two supply, I can go one over to the provinces. For four, two over to the hinterland. And you'll see the costs change up based on where you are. Provinces is always two no matter where you're going. And then Hinterland it becomes very expensive to go to the Cradle, but it's also pretty expensive to go to other sites there. And by the way, you can go to empty sites. You flip them over, reveal what's there. If they like have any free relics or whatever, you put it out right away. And I've got two supply left, although I don't have to spend all of it. I can push some forward to the next turn. But yeah, I do want to go ahead and muster for one supply. Like the AI did, I put a favor on a card in my site, and it can't have anything on it. You can't put stuff on a card that already has stuff on it, and I get two war bands. I don't want to give it to the beast card, because that's what they're most likely to get stuff from. So, I don't know, I'll put it on the order card. And that gets me five war bands in my supply, although it still pales in comparison to what the AI has. Now here's the thing, how much supply am I gonna go back to at the end of my turn? It's based on how many war bands are in my supply, 
Right now I've got nine, I've got them in kind of rows of three. So I'll go up to the highest I can go, which you'll notice is one less than I started with, but if I stop now, I'll also get the one I had left over. So I'd go to there. Whereas if I spend the one supply, I'll just go up to here. That being said, I have two secrets and they come back at the end of the turn anyway. So let's try to starve the AI out of favor a bit and steal from their preferred suit. I have no advisors matching the B suit, so I just get one favor, no bonus, but now there's only one there, so uh, less likely that they'll be able to get much. All right, and I go back up to the nine plus spot. All my secrets come back, so I am up to three now. And nomads are getting two favor, order one. And that's it for a round. We have a few more actions to go through, but you'll see things will go faster and faster. We're back to the Clockwork Prince, and I'm absolutely not a threat to them, so they're going to search and play a card. And we do have a Vision card, but the AI does not reveal it, although it will still tick up the Vision scene. So that means drawing from the World deck costs three supply, and if one more Vision is seen, it's going to cost four, and we can win with Visions after that. But looking at the actual cards they got, ah, oh, they got a Battle Plan, they're going to gain another Tactic, and they got a Nomad card and a Beast card. But, but, but things have changed a bit. They are now in this quadrant, which says play a friend or make an unaligned a friend. And beasts are definitely not unaligned, so they're gonna go with the nomads and move them up to the first friend spot. So that'll be two actions for them again. And they're going to play horse archers. Let's not forget to give them the tactic. And discard Aaron Boy and the Unseen Vision, although I could go dig it in the discard pile if I want to know what it is. And both of the Cradle sites are full, so they're going to play to a revealed site in the provinces instead, the top most available. So there are now Horse Archers there. And alright, two actions. So their first preference is to check, are they battle ready? And what that means in shorthand is, are the number of attack dice they would roll from attacking, which is usually based on their war bands plus their tactics, is that greater than the number of defense that their foe might roll? And in this case, they're looking for the player that controls the most sites, who might compete with them if that becomes the victory condition. But since I don't control anything, they're instead going to go after the bandits, which are said to rule any site with nobody's warband on it. And they want the leftmost, topmost, so they're going to charge over to the ancient city as their first action. And that's because they do this little special action that is both a travel action and a campaign action. That's a combat. Let's see how that works. So first they choose their targets, and they have to attack the site where they are, but they can also attack as many other sites owned by the same player as they like. And the AI always wants to attack as many as possible, so all three of these face-up sites count as held by the same bandits, and they can attack all of them. And remember, they're going to check their attack versus the defense. Each site gives one defense die, this little blue icon. And additionally, when nobody's there, they count as having one bandit warband, basically. So this is kind of like a defense of six by the AI's thinking, which they easily eclipse. Oh, by the way, I forgot to give a nomad favor to the AI for playing the horse archers. All right, now the attacker collects as many attack dice as warbands they want to use in the attack. In this case, they have 10, and the AI always wants to use all of them. So there we go. They also have two more from the tactics, which gets them to 12. But as you'll see in a second, they're going to lose some. Because the bandits automatically use any battle plans that they control that don't have a cost. So in this case, they're actually going to discard the horse archers to give the AI minus three dice. This is plus or minus three attack dice. So that's down to nine. And then because the AI is targeting this site, the bandit rampart's going to take them down to seven. But the AI also uses what they can. So they're going to get longbows to bring them to eight. And the rain boots will let them ignore their opponent's single shield. But then that'll also get discarded in a second. So a lot of cards going away. And defense is rolled first. Remember, the bandits have one, two, three defense dice from the three sites. And we're ignoring single shields rolled here. Ooh, which was very good for the AI because each single shield basically acts like one more warband that has to be defeated. And then this doubler doubles the value of all dice rolled. So like if they'd gotten that, they would have had a plus four, but now with this being ignored, they have a plus zero. So the AI just has to overcome three warbands. One, two, three for the three bandit sites they're attacking. So their eight dice is probably overkill. And indeed, but actually they got super lucky because there's this die result that gives them two attack to overcome the defender's value, but they have to lose one of their warbands. But here they instead got the safe stuff. So that's one, two, three attack for filled swords. Unfilled swords, you need two of them. So that's five attack. And remember, they need to exceed the final defense value, which was three, so they win. Now, if they had not exceeded the defense straight out, like let's say the defender had gotten four shields from the doubler, they can get rid of warbands one for one to increase their attack value. So the attacker often has the power to kind of push a win through if they need to. Now, because they won, they can put their warbands on these places, and they like to split them up as evenly as possible. 
while still keeping any remainder in their personal warband. And there is a kind of semi-official variant on BGG with the playtesters of the game, where you count the AI's board as like one of the sites that's being divided among. So here I gave each of the four sites with their board being counted as one, two warbands, and the remainder of two is here as well. So they kind of keep more with them, which tends to make them play better. All right, so they rule the whole darn world, uh, but they still have one action left. So they look and their next preference is, are they battle ready? They still have four warbands and there are face down sites to attack. So yes, they're gonna do it again. So with them already ruling all face up sites, they're going to go to the leftmost, topmost face down site. So he's going to uh, travel over here. Oh, and they're happy about this one. It's a mine, so it's got three favor on it. They'll get it if they take control of that. All right, and this time, no battle rampart to decrease the attack dice. The defender just has a single one, but it will count now because their rain boots are gone. They've got four dice from their warbands, two from their tactics, one from their longbows back in the cradle. Yeah, I don't think this will be a challenge for them. Hey, but this time at least they did lose a guy, but yes, they win. And with three guys left, they're going to split it between the mine and their board and keep two. Well, that's it for their second action, and they're down a lot of warbands in their personal supply, which means maybe I can steal the Banner of Dark Secrets and try to get a win in here. All right, now it's to my turn. And by the way, we've basically seen all of the actions. The only one we haven't done is the recover action. It costs one supply, but you can only recover one of the banners, remember, if you spend more than what's already there. And also for the Banner of Darkest Secrets, you kind of need like someone to betray the person who currently has it. So it says players can only recover this from you if there's a card at your site whose suit does not match any of your advisors. And for the AI advisors or any suits that are in the Conspirators column, but since there are currently literally no cards at the mind, there's nobody to betray them. So if I wanted to take the Darkest Secret this turn, I need to like come in here, put a card down that is not matching the beast suit, and then I could grab it. Maybe I'll do that. And the recover action, that one supply is also how you gain the relics again by paying the cost indicated. And you know what? Whoops, silly me. I should have uh, read the power text. Actually, the mine means that if you start your turn there, have your wake step there, you get to take one thing from it. So if I go to the mine, I'll get to steal some favor as well. So let's see, can I realistically get the darkest secret this turn? I'd have to spend two supply to get to where the AI is, uh, spend one supply to recover it, but also at least two supply to play a card there. So man, it would be tight. But you know what, whatever, even though it might be a little bit early and foolhardy, I'm gonna do it. So I'm gonna spend two supply to move to the mine. There we go, I'm gonna spend two supply to play a card from the discard pile of the provinces. And it works the same, I draw the top three cards. This is a vision I didn't see. Oh, this is actually a false vision, it's not a way to win. But it's a conspiracy, when played, you may burn a secret to take one relic or banner from a player whose pawn is at your site. Ooh, trigger its when seized if it's a banner. Oh, but you must have at least two advisors whose suits match any of their advisors, which is only Beast right now. So, no. And what else do we have? The Rain Boots again, or the Aaron Boy? Interesting. Remember, to steal the banner, it has to be a suit that they don't have an advisor for, so I basically have to play the Rain Boots, and these will get discarded to the Hinterland. So, there we go, and that is gonna get me a favor from playing that for the Nomads. Oh, by the way, I can peek at the Relic. Book of Records. When you search, you gain, ooh, secrets instead of favor when you play to a site. That's pretty cool. All right, all right, in for a penny, in for a pound. Let's see what happens. So go ahead and spend one to recover. I'm getting the banner of darkest secrets. And it says I have to place more secrets here than the old ones. Then I take one. If there was more than one, I would give the rest back to the previous owner. So I put my three secrets here. I get one back. That's nice of them. And additionally, I get this Oath Keeper tile that you've probably seen for the Chancellor. This gives plus one defense whenever that player is attacked, so it's gonna protect me from them, hopefully. And the key thing for me is during the wake phase, at the start of my turn, I'm gonna flip it if I'm an exile, and then if I survive another turn, I win the game. So that's how I can win with the official Oath. I have to keep the Banner of the Darkest Secret in this case for uh, two straight turns against the AI trying to take it with all their might. And speaking of them having a lot of might, let's spend my last supply and and put some money on the rain boots to muster two more war bands. They only have two war bands. I now have seven, even with all of their bonuses, I might survive. Let's see. That does take me down to seven guys in my supply. Those when I end my turn, I'm going up to that spot. Didn't have any left, and that's eight to four. And the only thing to clean up was the favor on the rain boots going to the nomad supply. All right, don't murder me too hard, Chancellor. Let's see what happens. Okay, so now the first step, he's gonna assess threat. Is there a threat? No, there's no threat, right? There's nothing, don't worry about it. So yes, there is a threat. In this case, it's an exile who has the Oathkeeper tile. And the space says Oathkeeper goal. What that means is the AI says, forget all this trying to conquer sites. We need to get the darkest secrets. So they go back to this threat space, which is going to focus them on trying to get secrets or attack me to get that banner back. 
But besides that, their turn plays out basically as normal. They're gonna draw three. No, 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 no! I'm upset here because they got the exact suit they wanted. They're going to uh, move that up, which means they're gonna get extra secrets. Oh, this is terrible. And they get four actions, no! So martial culture and secret police get discarded. But this is another one they can't play. It's advisor only, so they're going to discard that as well. Which means everything is terrible. They can't play the card. They're going to get a warband for free. They're going to get a third secret. They're going to increase their threat. Oh no, there was also one of the battle plans in there. Their threat is at max. And because they discarded the card instead of playing, they're going to get one money from Beast onto their ambition. This is not good. This is like literally <laughs> the worst possible thing that could happen. So they've got four actions and we look. The red says, do they hold the dark secret banner? No, they don't. Then orange has two. Higher priority is, are they battle ready to attack me and steal it back? Otherwise, they're going to try to buy it. If they can't do that, they're going to try to get some more secrets. So are they battle ready? I mean, gosh, they probably are, right? They've got three attackers, plus three from their tactic, six. And they have some longbows and rain boots to use. That'll put them to seven. But they have to attack me to actually get it. And I've got seven. Plus, I get plus one defense die for each secret here, so that'd be 10. Plus one for the Oath Keeper, 11. Get out of here, they aren't bad already. And they also can't pay yet because they have three secrets, but that's how many's there and they have to exceed it. So they're gonna take the black option here and they're going to try to trade for secrets. And how they trade for secrets or favor is based on their suits and where they're located. In the case of secrets, they're gonna be looking for beast cards. That's the only one they have in the conspirators column, but they're gonna get two secrets for each beast. Oh my Lord. Now, lucky for me, there are no beasts here and they can't trade for secrets with the nomads. So they actually skip this action, which means it doesn't count as one of their four. Now they check, can they pay? No, they still can't. So now they're gonna move to the location where they can get the most secrets, which means they're running back to the cradle, the only place with a beast card. And that's action one, action two, they are gonna trade for secrets and for favor. So they'll gain one favor for each nomad card and two secrets for each beast. No nomads here, but there is a beast card. So we're getting two more secrets. You guys are killing me. So boom, boom, they're up to five. And by the way, the AI does not put tokens on cards when they trade, only when they muster those jerks. And now we check, can they pay? Yeah, of course they can pay, get out of here. So remember when they take it, they're gonna get one of my three secrets and I get the other two back. And they always choose to put as many secrets as possible. So wow, that looks, that looks tough guys. And they are the Oath Keeper again. My brief attempt at victory was totally foiled. And what are they gonna do now? Uh, looks like they're gonna go all the way over here and scout again. Oh, they did find another vision. Oh man, maybe I'll try to get it and see what it is. Now in the quadrant they're in, now they prefer to play a friend. So even though they got, geez, another beast card, they're not gonna play it. Oh, they got a nomad. Why do they keep on getting the same stuff? The battle plan bonus doesn't matter anymore. They're already at max tactics, but they are gonna move that up. And because the rain boots went away, there is room for the great crusade here. What is it? Per noble card, you rule plus or minus that many attack dice, men at the end, discard Great Crusade. And currently they rule one, two, three. Ah, oh, these cards are killing me. But remember, this vision is going to the provinces where I am. Oh, my gosh, I might have to look at it. So it's back to me, everybody, and man, oh man, the pain is just palpable. I don't even have that many actions. Uh, I could try to compete by getting more money, like using my elders to get secrets, but it just seems like it would never work out. Oh, oops, by the way, they got one favor from starting on the mine, and so do I. All right, is my first action foolish or not? I do want to see what that vision was. So I'm drawing the top three cards on another one, and you don't stop at visions, by the way, when you draw from a discard pile. All right, so most relics and banners. I could get a relic right now, so that would put me at one to the AI's two. Oh, or vision of rebellion. If I have the people's favor, then I could win. Yeah, we're not gonna worry about you, beast card, get out of here. I think this might be the way to go. So the Banner of the People's Favor is a bit like the Darkest Secret. It's favor that you have to use instead of secrets, but you have to put more on here than's already there. And the bonus for this one, it's a pretty huge one, is that when you play a card, you can play it to any site in your region instead of just the actual site you're on. And you can also get rid of a card first. Like I could get rid of their beast card that gives them a ton of secrets. But at the beginning of each of your turns, you have to either put money here or take money from here and put it on the supply that has the least, like beasts here. So it kind of sucks away all your money, but man. Okay, okay, I'm gonna play this. And what the heck, I'm gonna reveal it. No, I'm not, I'm not gonna reveal it yet because then he'll know what I'm up to. I'm just gonna try to build up a ton of money this turn, set up for next turn. I think that's a smart way to play it. So that'll be face down. All right, so money, money, money. I'll go ahead and do a uh, secret on the rain boots. One supply with my elders. That is the last two from Nomads. That gets me to four, not bad. 
And actually, you know what? I think I'll stop there because that'll get me to full supply for next turn. And I can try to like really go crazy, try to get a bunch of money, get the people's banner, maybe hire some war bands, try to survive. Oh, I should have moved this, which means now I can win with vision. Chancellor, here you go. Okay, he's back to no threat, no worries about me at all. Drawn three cards. He's still in the friend quadrant, so the left mouth, he's gonna make Hearth a friend. I only have two actions. Oh, but he can't play because it's an advisor only, so he's probably gonna get something awesome. He's getting two favor plus another from the Hearth pile. And these all go in ambition, but the two things ambition can be used for are getting relics or getting the people's banner. So he has like a brilliant favor, I hit you. And he's doing two actions. He has to go up here. He's gonna travel to where he can get the most favor. Stop it! And look at this. Every Nomad card he does gets him two favor. Oh, wait, wait. Nomad is empty. Yes. So actually, he can only get favor from Hearth cards. And he's already at the only place with a Hearth card. So he's gonna skip this action entirely, go up to trading for secrets and for money. Jeez. So he gets one favor from the Hearth supply and two more secrets. Yeah, glad I'm not competing with him there. Okay, that was one action. Now he wants to get a relic. Ooh, if he buys it, that'll use up a bunch of his money. And he's gonna go to the map, uh, but that's it. He only has two actions, so he'll have to wait until next time to actually buy it, which will be three favor. Do I like wait and just keep on getting rich maybe? Well, the problem with that plan is I only have a Nomad Advisor and yeah, there's no money on Nomad, so. So I think I wanna get another Advisor to have more money production. So let's uh, go ahead and search first. And oh, I get to see what that last vision he drew was. Vision of Faith. Ha! <laughs> Hold the darkest secret. Get out of here. Okay, or Garrison's now, which couldn't be an advisor, or Charming Friend, which has to be an advisor. Secret. Ooh, take one favor from a player's pawn is at your sight. I will rob you. So yes, that is absolutely the winner. Oh, I almost forgot, but this is important. I get the favor from the mine, yes. Okay, I'm gonna travel to where he is to have my friend talk to him. So blip, hello, hello. And actions on cards like this are minor actions. So I'll just put a secret here. I'll get it back in a second. I'll steal one of his money. Thank you very much. And I think I'm gonna travel up to the plains and trade once to get some more money. And I'm gonna put it on the memory of home, of course, to get their hearth money. Since I'm an advisor, that gets me two and that's all that's left on hearth. So all of their friends currently have no money and I have a little bit, just a little. <laughs> I think I did have one left, so I'll be up to there for next turn. Now we're almost to the round where they would get to roll a die, and on a six, they would automatically win. But they're not there yet. They're going to search because there's no threat for me yet. I'm just biding my time. Oh, and it's a new one. Ooh, this is great. The relic hunting quadrant they're in wants them to play conspirator, so they're not even going to have anybody else to get favor with. So alchemists become a level one conspirator. They get two actions. Oh my gosh, I want to use this, I want to use this. Look, a secret and a trash a secret. Gain four favor from any favor bank or banks. And that's going over to the leftmost that has room right there. Now they are going to get a favor from the arcane supply for playing that. And now they have actions. Yes, they can pay for the relic at their site. And they're going to use the favor from their ambition first, which leaves them with only two there. They get the map, okay. Okay, and their second action, do they hold the most relics and banners? Of course they do. So they're, oh, they're gonna muster, I don't like that. Oh, wait, wait, maybe I do like that because you know what you use for mustering? Favor, they are down to only one, two, three. Oh, but I gotta boost up my army to survive. Actually, they're not too terrifying. They've got seven war bands, but they've also got all of those uh, battle plans. And by the way, the Nomad gets their money. And yeah, that is it, time to enact my attack. So we're gonna activate our vision of rebellion. They know what we're up to now. And let's see, before I get the banner, I think I want to get more units. So yeah, let's do one, two, three muster actions, just like they do. And almost all my supply gone, but I get almost every war band I can hold. Then I'm going to spend two to travel over to the provinces. Where am I going, you might ask? Hello, alchemist. As a free action, I will put a secret there and burn one forever to get four favor from wherever I want. And let's see, he likes nomads. Let's take that away and get some of the order favor as well. Then for my final action, boom. So I have to put the uh, old favor in favor banks. I guess I'll put it in beast and you can get favor from them. And I'm putting, what is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine money. Oh, it all fell. I'm putting it on here. Everything. All right, come at me, bro. And by the way, I <laughs> do not have much supply, obviously. But if he doesn't get this back, 
I win because there are three visions and I just have to last until my next turn. So the AI would have gotten a chance to win on a six on a D6, but no such luck. Oh wait, no, no, he does get to do that. Because I forgot, that's not about my vision. That's about him being the Oath Keeper and he is, don't get a six, no! All right, you know what, I want to see what would have happened, but yeah, so he wins. Oh, what a jerk. But here, let's play it out, let's play it out. So, completed vision, he's going to jump to that vision goal, which means he's over here wanting to try to pay for the people's favor. Would have drawn three cards. This one's friends, so we would have played the hearth one. Wouldn't have gotten any favor, there's none left, but that would have moved up. And he would have had three actions, so he certainly can't pay, he's only got three money. Oh, but actually, he would have looked at that already. There's no way he's battle ready. I don't care how cool he is. Because look, I've got 5, 10, 13, plus 9 defense dice from this. So yeah, what would he have done? What would he have done? He would have tried to get money where he is. Which would be nothing because I emptied your favor out. Ha ha ha. But you know, let's see how it could have gone. Because you can choose to let the AI intelligently use powers. So they could have used Memory of Home since they rule it. Put one of their secrets there to move all the favor from one bank to the hearth bank. Oh, that still wouldn't help them. Never mind, they wouldn't do that yet. So they'd skip that action and they would travel where they can get the most money, which is going to be the memory of home. Okay, then for their second action, they would get favor there. They could use that secret power I said, and that would get them two, but they would still be so far away. And then as their third, they would muster to try to get more units. So yeah, they would not have been able to stop me. I would have won. No. But hey, that one in six chance is how it goes sometimes. Let's see how the chronicle will be written for the end of this game. So they've got this nice little summary. First, the winner vows a new oath. And basically, if they won by an oath, not by a vision, they have to pick a different one. And for the AI, they just do it randomly. So, oh, the Oath Keeper of the People this time. They'd want to hold the people's favor. All right, then because they won, they would try to build an edifice on the leftmost place they could. I'd just say the leftmost card. So the Memory of Home would go back to the World deck, and they would build the matching edifice, the Hall of Debate. Players cannot target the people's favor, so you could not get the people's favor by attacking someone. You would have to pay for it. Now, next is the interesting thing. You keep all the sites of the winner rules, but get rid of the others, which means, like, this map will basically be almost exactly the same in the next game because they rule friggin' everything. But what does happen is you kind of consolidate. You take away these. The lush coast would slide over here. The standing stones would slide over here. And like the bandit rampart is still there. This relic is still there. All these things would stay around for the next game. But I'd shuffle these into the deck and we'd get some random new ones here. Oh, actually, wait, I forgot. Places with ruins always go to like the bottom most available place because they're all messed up, I guess. Now, next is one of the kind of fun and most touted parts of the game. You're going to take six cards from the archives, this like out of game set of cards. You're going to add them to the world deck and you're going to get rid of six cards from the discard piles and or players advisors who lost. So the deck will kind of evolve as the game goes on and new cards will show up. In this case, the AI liked beasts the most. So we're going to add three beast cards, two nomad and one discord. And we take my two Disgraced Advisors and all the discards, and again, we're going to randomly discard six of these from the game. And then, yeah, you can pack up all the sites, you can reshuffle the entire world deck, set it up with visions kind of interspersed throughout the uh, deck, and you're ready to go. In this case, I would be in exile again next time, because I could not defeat the Clockwork Prince. So that is Oath. Again, not going to do a review, but hang on if you want to hear my thoughts on the solo play of the game. So what do I think of Oath Solo? Well, the first thing I want to start with is I think the core gameplay here is great. I really like the simplicity of the actions, the huge variety in the card effects, the way that things kind of like meld and shift over time. I think for a group of uh, three or more players or even two players with the Automa kind of jumping in to mix things up can be really cool. But we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about Solo and how is that? So what you just saw, the Automa as the Chancellor, tends to work pretty well. As you saw, they kind of like move through all the quadrants and they do a little bit of everything so that they're not a complete pushover for any of the victory conditions, but they tend to be extra focused on the thing that makes them the Oath Keeper. The second that a major threat identifies itself, they try to crush it with overwhelming force. That all works pretty well. And I gotta say, compared to like coin flowcharts, this one is like so easy to follow. You only have maybe three or four choices to consider. Usually they're very obvious. That's all nice. And the way their turn runs is pretty quick and easy as well. 
I think the uh, playing cards and moving their stuff up is okay. My one big negative with it is if they like really divide themselves up and kind of spread themselves really thin, they can get very few actions. Whereas if they just happen to get lucky and keep on drawing the same thing, they can get a ton. Now it does limit how much favor and secrets they can get because they only have a certain suits represented. But besides that, there's not really any penalty for them getting lucky. And very similar thing for the tactics. The fact that like in some games I've played, they've gotten a ton of battle plans early and they are incredibly strong in combat. And in other games, they just like didn't draw very many at all. It's all luck of the draw and that I don't love because both their actions and their combat strength can be very swingy and can really change up the feel of the game. But the other major thing in playing against the Chancellor is that they are so spread out trying to do a little bit of everything that if you really like bide your time and build up to a big combo like I did and only the luck of the dice kind of messed me up, you can put yourself in a very difficult situation for them to kind of catch up and win. Because unlike a real player, they can't see that I'm building up a billion favor. If they did, they would know what I was going to do and they would try to like nip it in the bud and steal money from me and stuff right away. But the AI just kind of meanders about their business doing a little bit of everything and has no idea. So you can get kind of these anticlimactic wins where you get a sudden vision. Boom, good to go. Again, better with two players in an automa because the other player will try to stop you, but the AI sometimes isn't able to. But the biggest weak point of the game when it comes to solo is the thing I didn't show you. I wanted to show you the game at its best, and I hope that was a pretty fun playthrough to watch. But when the Clockwork Prince is the exile and you are the Chancellor, all they do every turn is keep on bouncing back to the same threat space that matches whatever the current goal is, so they'll just keep on going to the people's favor, and they just hammer that same thing over and over again. Which in some ways kind of works, right? Because uh, they don't need visions, they can just try to become the Oath Keeper and the Usurper and win the game that way, that's fine. But because they ignore visions, because you know exactly what they're going to go for, it becomes a very stale experience sometimes. And the big thing is they can get into like these very dumb loops. Like in several of the games I've played, like I would say about half of them, at least once the AI has gotten into a loop where they're just doing kind of useless actions because it becomes very easy with them being so focused on a single thing to block them out in many ways. And yes, you could say, well, you played well, you won, but it hasn't been satisfying. And the thing is, whenever you win as the Chancellor, if you're playing solo and you want to keep the cool campaign stuff going and keep the decks going, if you want to play as Chancellor, they have to be the Exile. So theoretically, if you win half the time and lose half the time, half of the games are going to be with this like really unsatisfying AI, and then the other half will be with the better but still kind of flawed AI. So do I recommend Oath? Yes, if you're going to play this competitive, I think this game is great. I really like Cole's design. If you have seen my previous videos, you know Root is one of my top games of all time. Pax Pamir is right up there. But here's the key thing. The Root solo that they designed was not that great until a fan made the better bot project and made Root solo one of my favorite experiences. Pax Pamir's second edition, the solo was not designed by Cole or anybody else. It was designed by Ricky Royal, and he did an awesome job. So I think in all honesty, this reminds me a lot of the Clockwork Cats from the original first Root expansion, which was not that great of a system, but had the makings of a good system that the fans could run with and improve. So there's a possibility that fans will jump in and make a way better version of this that is more consistent, gives more play options, lets you have two Automa in the game at the same time. You can kind of like cludge that together, but right now there's no way to have a three character game solo. And I think that would definitely improve things a lot. And uh, yeah, hopefully you enjoyed the play because I had a lot of fun playing it. I often have fun playing this game, but solo, not its best look. Good gaming, everyone. Thanks for watching and I'll see you at the next stop.